أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لترابي مخدمه الفداء أما بعد يقول الله في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وجاء أخوة يوسف فدخلوا عليه فعرفهم وهم له منكرون And the brothers of Yusuf came and they entered upon him and he recognized them but he was to them unknown. Inshallah, to start tonight's measures, we want to first and foremost send our heartfelt condolences to Maqam of Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman on the occasion which is so close to the demise and the martyrdom of the Lady of Light, Sayyidina Fatima al Zahra alayha wa salati wa salam. Secondly, in honor of Fatima al Zahra tonight, being the defender of the religion, being the one that protected the Imam of her time, as well as endured the suffering, the hardship, and the oppression in order for her to first and foremost protect the Imam, protect the religion, not as a husband, but an Imam of her time, inshallah, tonight's topic will be revolving around Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, being the Imam of our time. And to be inspired by Sayyidina Fatima al-Zahra, we want to take her as a role model in order for us to better understand the Imam of our time and how to understand where he is, what he's doing, and his mission in this particular ghaybah. Now, when discussing such a topic as Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman, you find people have different angles of viewing such a topic. As an example, when you ask someone about Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman, one of the angles that people try to look at the life of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman is to discuss his appearance. As many of us, many of us like to understand better the person at a very, let's say, outer level. In understanding, we try to understand how the Imam will look, as in how tall will the Imam be, what's his complexion. You know, we know that the Imam is technically half Italian because his mom's from a Roman descent being a princess. So some people come forth and discuss different appearances that the Imam will have, whereas the ahadith are very clear cut in that aspect. People come forth, is the mole that's on his face, on his right or his left cheek? What complexion will he have? What color will he be? What will he be wearing when he comes? Other discussions revolve around the signs of reappearance. As in we understand that there are minor signs and there are major signs. Of the minor, there are many to discuss. Of the major ones, indefinitely there are arguably five major ones that if they were to occur, that we understand that within a year and a half to two years that the Imam will reappear. One of the signs, such as the one where the person, by the name of Nafs al Zakiya, if he is to be killed between al Rakni and Maqam, Imam will appear 15 days after that. And that's one of the five major signs that we are there to discuss. However, these discussions, as vital as they are, and as important they are, they are spoken about in a very abundant fashion. As in, we need many a topic talking about different signs, many discussions talking about the major and the minor signs. But the topic that we want to discuss tonight is the light that we have. Men matu wa men when wa men wa lam ya'arif imam zamanih matu mithlin jahili and the understanding of a person dies and does not understand and comprehend and identify the Imam of his time, he dies a death of ignorance, meaning a death of a person that's not a Muslim. Now, many of us will come and say, well, we know that our Imam is the 12th Imam. We all know his name. We can calculate his age, his mother and his father. But more than that, how much do we actually know about the Imam of our time? The discussion tonight will revolve around a particular aspect that's not spoken about. And that's the aspect of ghaybah in itself. 
Because we understand that, yes, there's a particular notion that we need to be in awaiting the imam. How to actively versus passively await the imam. What are we doing as an individual, as a family unit, as a community in preparation of the imam of our time? Or is it the opposite where we just wait and a time come when we hear the scream from the sky, from the angel saying that the imam is near? But the understanding from tonight is the concept of Raytha is an important concept that many of us will not look into its dynamic. Because if you ask the majority, let's say, of people that don't necessarily deem themselves to be very knowledgeable about the appearance of the Imam and where he is, so ask them, he says, well, the Imam is, and these are the opinions that come forth. Of them that say that the Imam is in a place known as the Bermuda Triangle. We've all heard this. Some people come forth and suggest that the Imam Sahib al Asli wa Zamani is in a place entitled Al Jazeera al Khadra, the Green Island. We'll find that there are many different opinions that come forth stating where the Imam is. We'll find all these opinions allude to the fact that the Imam is in hiding rather than being amongst us. We want to understand tonight by comparing two people. Through the Holy Quran, we want to compare the Prophet of Allah, Yusuf, and the example that he can give us to better understand our Imam and what he's doing for the last thousand plus years. Now, the different points we want to look at tonight is first and foremost, we want to understand what dictated the major and the minor occultation. As in, when we say minor versus major, the minor, does that mean that the Imam was amongst the people? Or was there a different aspect? And the major, why is it the major occultation? The comparison first and foremost. Secondly, we want to tackle these different, let's say, myths of the Imam being in these particular places of hiding. And try to understand how these myths came about and how we can tackle them to eradicate them, to better understand where the Imam is and what he's actually doing in the current moment and state of time. Then we want to look at, before we look at the example of Yusuf, to understand more in depth the concept of the Imam being in occultation, this particular terminology we want to delve into, to see the comparison, which one contradicts the other and which one works alongside. And the final one, we want to look at the comparison from the Holy Quran of Nabi Allah Yusuf and the Imam of our time, Imam Sahib al So inshallah, we can bless the Majlis and start the topic for tonight. Three of your salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. The first point, the major and the minor occultation differences. We know that the Imam born 255 years after Hijrah, and that the Imam first appeared at the death of his father at five years of age at 260 AH. Now, in his appearance that he came and he prayed, and people saw this five-year-old praying on his father, and they identified him to be the successor of Imam Hassan al-Askari, and they, in one way or another, chased him all the way back towards the Sildam that he went into occultation from. Now, when he went into occultation, this is the start of the minor occultation. So, if we haven't seen the Imam, why is there a minor and a major occultation? Question. That his minor occultation is from 260 AH to 329 after Hijra is known as the 69th period of his minor occultation. And that is the start, 329 is the start of the major occultation. So what's the difference? The minor occultation, we identify as the minor occultation because from 260 AH, it wasn't apparent to the people, because you have to understand the position of the time that the people at the time in charge of the government were trying tirelessly to try and kill the Imam one way or another as the savior that will come against and eradicate the tyranny that they were on. So they were trying to find him in any manner that they can. 
The difference between the minor and the major is the fact that we had a direct relation between the people and the Imam through four of his Sufara. These four people, one after the other, one would die, the next one would come, the next one would die, the next one would come, until the fourth one. When he dies, that is the start of the major occultation because all of a sudden we do not have a direct link to the Imam of our time, Imam Sahih al so It doesn't mean that the Imam was there, that people identified him and could be in close contact. No, it means that we had a direct link for 69 years in the time of these four Sufara. Then the major occultation starts. Now the question now is, because we want to get too much into the understanding of how we have a connection with the Imam, how do we get our jurisprudence, etc. That's a different topic for a different night, inshallah. But the understanding now is, where is the Imam? And how do these different aspects come into existence? This understanding that he's in the Bermuda Triangle, that we are waiting Allah to give him the permission to come out and speak out and eradicate tyranny and the wage the war, etc, etc, etc. And where did this understanding of al Jazeera al Khabra come into perspective? So this first one, let's tackle Bermuda Triangle, they say that Bermuda Triangle, we understand that anything that comes, whether it be by sea or by air, that if it comes across this triangle, it becomes no more. You don't have contact with it, you'll never see it again, and therefore, because it has some sorts of special powers, then without a doubt that the Imam of our time is residing there, one of them. The second suggests, and this is the one that's actually found in our Ahadith, Suggesting that Al-Mahdi, remember the terminology, is living in a Jazeera al-Khabra, in a green island. Where did this come from? You'll find researchers have looked into this idea. Where did it originate from? That we understand that Imam Al-Mahdi is in a Jazeera al-Khabra. So you'll find all the historians have come forth and they've allocated a time frame where in a dynasty by the name of Al-Fatimi dynasty, there was a ruler, because as we know, people were given the glad tidings of a person by the name of Al-Mahdi that will be the savior. So this became a very popular name amongst many people to name their sons Al-Mahdi. Now you'll find one of the Fatimi dynasties, Khulafa, was given the title Al-Mahdi. So where does Jazirat al-Khadra come from? Jazirat al-Khadra is one of the names given because as Islam expanded, it expanded into different locations. Of these locations was a place by the name of Al-Andalus, modern-day Spain. They called it Al-Jazirat al-Khadra because you can imagine the Arabs coming from the desert, all of a sudden they come into a land that's green. To identify, they have very easy identifications, so they called this the Green Island. So all of a sudden, this Al-Mahdi from the Fatimid dynasty has built himself a palace that he lived in. So the historians all of a sudden start writing the hadith that Al-Mahdi lives in Al-Jaziratul Khadra. And this is carried on. When someone comes across the hadith, look, I found that in Al-Hadith it says Al-Mahdi is in Al-Jaziratul Khadra. Therefore he's hiding and he's isolated away. Where is Al-Jaziratul Khadra? We don't know. He's isolated from the community and he's in hiding. That's the understanding that comes from. Whereas we find in the tradition is absolute opposite that we understand from Imam Sahib al Asr. So, okay, we've understood the misconceptions that occur. That people will try to isolate him to different places anytime they find a place of secrecy, a new hidden area within the ocean, a new pyramid that's found. They say that Imam might be here. Why? Because he's hiding, and we understand he's away from the community. Let's look at the terminologies to better understand this whole concept of occultation. We find Ghayba is always translated as occultation, occultation. Many of us come across this as a new word. Occultation basically has two different meanings. The first is hidden from view. The second is lost to notice. Now, keep a mind on the second, not the first, hidden. Lost from notice. Keep that in the back of your mind. We have the terminologies in Arabic. Al-Ghayba and al buhur And then we have another one called al hubur Three. A lot of us that have an Arabic background, try to understand these and translate them within yourself. 
غيبة is the one that the Imam is hearing. Many of us translate غيبة as being hidden, being away. غائب in the sense from the community. When we say ظهور, he comes and reveals himself from hiding. That's a misconception. When we say غيبة, initially it means veiled from your knowledge. Comprehend this fact. It's very vital for the next points. Veiled from your knowledge, not from the community. As in he may be amongst us, but you cannot identify that this is the Imam. He may be one way or another sitting right next to you in one particular gathering. He would have shared food on a particular table of Abba Abdullah. He could have walked past you in a particular majlis. Lest you know it's the Imam. Why? Because he's in the aspect of being veiled from your knowledge. The opposite of ghaib is vahir, meaning he becomes apparent. So when the Imam is in ghaibah, when he comes out, he becomes the dhuhur. Then there's the hudur, which doesn't contradict the first aspect of being in ghaibah. He can be hadhar, meaning he can be amongst us. However, he can be veiled from our knowledge. We've all understood this? This is a very vital point. If you understood it, inshallah, salam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now that we've understood these particular terminologies, let's apply it. We have a hadith from Abu Basir, from Imam al Baqir that said the following. Bismillah ar-Rahman, he says, We're not concentrating on al hira at the moment. We're concentrating on the ghayb. Imam al-Baqir dictates to us that all of a sudden there's a comparison between the life of Imam al-Mahdi and the ghayb of Prophet Yusuf. Now let's look at chapter 12 of the Holy Quran to better understand in different manners the concept of ghayb to understand what the Imam is doing for the last thousand plus years. If we understand that he's not in hiding, what is he doing in these particular years? Looking at the story of Yusuf, to understand this aspect of Ghaibah being present but veiled. We begin to read, we come across ayah 9 of Surah Yusuf, chapter 12 of the Holy Quran. The brothers of Yusuf come together and they say to themselves, let's kill Yusuf. Yes or no? We come across this verse. The brothers come together to try to murder their own brother in order for them to be isolated with their father because he was showing too much attention. Now, had they known that Yusuf, their own brother, was a prophet, would they have done such a thing? Question. Physically, he's there. They understand that he's brother. But the ghaibah is a ghaibah of a maqam. They did not know the status of Yusuf. Even though they knew him by name and by lineage, they did not know he was a prophet of Allah subhanahu the first, let's move on. Then they go on and they put him in what the Quran describes as Ghayabatul Jum. The darkness or the hiding or the veilment of the well that they threw him in instead of killing him. Two. Three, ayah 19 and ayah 20, a caravan comes and they lift him from the well, not knowing who Yusuf is, either by name, by lineage, or by status. They take him, Yusuf, his brothers come in ayah 20 of chapter 12 and they sell the Prophet of Allah. Had they known that Yusuf was a Prophet, do you think they would have, as the Quran states, sold him for such a very little price, feminine bus? You can count how much in your hands, how much they sold a Prophet of Allah for. From one angle, the second angle, do you think the caravan knew that it was a prophet, they would buy him for that much? Doesn't make sense. Therefore, there was an aspect of veilment of who Yusuf was. Was he present or wasn't he present? He was present. But he was in an aspect, one way or another, of ghayb. When we take this and put it into the example of Imam Sahih al Asir, he went on, didn't he? When he went to Masa, he was put in jail. When he was in jail, did it stop him from performing his tasks as a prophet of Allah? 
He began to prepare himself for the government that he would establish later on. Preaching within the jails, like the Imams prior to him. You'll find Imam Sabi Asr al Zaman is doing the exact same thing. Imam al when he's in jail, do you think it stops him from preaching, from doing his duties just because he's veiled within that jail? No, it does not stop him from performing the acts that he needs to perform. Doing the duties that Allah has bestowed upon him. It doesn't matter what kind of veil that he's in. You'll find out Imams wasn't in a position of power, yet it does not stop them from performing their duties. Ali ibn Talib when the Khilafah is taken from him, he served. You think he stopped or was he there to protect Islam? He says, All right, give us a modern day aspect. You have many, many aspects of the stories of the relationship that Imam Zahid al Zaman would have with the community to try to protect Islam, to protect the message, to protect even individuals. Story of Sheikh al Mufid, many of us would come across it. How many of us have delved into the importance and the effect that Imam Sahib al Zaman had in such an instance? The story is a person comes to Sheikh al Mufid. This person had a wife and an infant that hasn't been born as of yet. In child labor, you'll find that the mother all of a sudden dies. But the doctors say there may be a chance that we can save that child that's in her womb. So he says, well, I'm not sure that I can dissect the body of a dead. Let me go and ask my marja in order for me to understand. Can I do such a thing? Can't I do such a thing? So you'll find this person goes to Sheikh al Mufid. Sheikh al Mufid, this is the story my wife has died. It's very vital that you let me know this ruling as fast as you can because we need to perform surgery fast. So Sheikh al Mufid, in the understanding that a dead person, you cannot perform particular, you know, cutting of a dead person's body because it's sacred. He gives the ruling that you should not you know, start cutting into a dead person's body. He says, no, you should not. You should bury her as she is because the infant would have died as well. So this man goes. A few months later, he comes back. When he comes back, he has a son in his hands. Now let's look at this aspect. He comes to Sheikh and he says, Sheikh Mohammed, I want to thank you for what you have done for me and my family. He says, what have I done? He says, had it not been for you, then my son would have died with his mother. He says, please elaborate. He says, when I left, you sent a messenger after me. When you sent that messenger, that messenger told me, no, Sheikh Al-Mufid has instructed me to tell you it's fine. Go cut your wife in order for you to extract your child and save his life. He says, if you had not sent that particular messenger from your end, then I would not be holding this son in my hand. And it would have been as hard to lose both my wife and my child in one instance. Now I have some sort of happiness in my life knowing that my wife died, but I have my son to carry the world. Sheikh al Mufid begins to cry and he says to him, he says, oh man, it wasn't me that sent the messenger. He knew then that it was Imam Sahib al Asir al-Zaman. That he is the one that protected our life. And he not only did that, but he gave us a ruling in the instance. And that's why you look at our scholars. Sheikh al-Mufid says, I made a mistake that could have caused an infant to die. I will no longer give the fatwas towards the Shia. I remove myself. In which you'll find the Imam will come to him and say the following lines Ya Mufid Afid, alayka al fatawa wa alayhi al tasdeed. Meaning, O oh Shaykh al Mufid, benefit the community. You do your part in benefiting them and will be there as a safety net. In case you say something that which is outside these boundaries, we'll make sure that we keep it within the boundaries. So when we find in the first understanding Yusuf was amongst the community and protecting the message and safeguarding it, likewise Imam Sahib al-Hasir al-Zaman on many occasions. This is one of the many stories that we have that he safeguarded 
the religion, that he was amongst us in the community. And many of us will come with the understanding, well, okay, then we understand the Imam is amongst us. There's traditions that say when the Imam reveals himself, but majority of people will come forth and state that I have seen this person, that I have come across this person, but I did not know it was the Imam. So imagine, what would we have been doing when the Imam crossed our minds? Other people will come and say, well, it doesn't matter. You know, I've lost my path, and the path that I've lost will not affect the Imam Sahib al-Hasri wa Zaman, on the contrary. Within the whole Quran, we'll find in the story of Musa, it gives us this example that the Prophet of Allah was hurt from something that his brothers did. As we know, when he puts the goblet into the wheat sack of one of his brothers, and the person from the courtroom screams out, thief, thief, and they stop everyone to find the goblet. And he says, you guys have stolen. The reply of the brother stated that if he has stolen, he has a brother that stole before him. The Quran says, Yusuf was affected, but he kept it within his heart. That, that word affected him, hurt him, but he kept it secret within himself. Likewise, Imam Sahib al Zaman, you think of ourselves calling ourselves of the followers of the Imam if we were to do something. Negative, it would not affect the Imam. You say that I'm no one, I'm a Shia, doesn't mean that you are no one, no. Mama Sadiq has a beautiful statement. And it's referred to Imam Sadiq that says, A sin is a sin. If you take nothing from tonight, take this point. It says, A sin is a sin, but for me, being of the followers, it's worse. And a good deed is beautiful, but from you being of the followers, it's much better. Why? It says a sin. When anyone sins, it's a bad aspect on your soul, on existence, on the community. It has different aftermath. But because you are a Shia of any of the that when you sin and people see you sinning, people will say, this is how the Shia are raised having a negative effect and a negative impact on how they view the Imams. Likewise, when you do a good deed, it's good, but because you are from the Shia, from the followers, it's better. Why? Because they see that beauty that you've done and they say, this is how the people that follow this religion were raised. Imam Sahib al-Asri wa Zaman was a person that came towards our hand. Look at this aspect, because you have to understand that at any moment, you could come across the Imam of your time. A person comes, this is a Sayyid of a Masjid. The story is narrated that this person comes towards a a mystic of the time, and he asks him. So you know the mystics of the time, many of them had different ways to perform different acts of worship for a specific time frame in order for them to be in close contact in one way or another to the Imam of their time. So he gives them a, a prescription in order for him to carry out. He says, continue these aspects of worship. Within six months, you will, in one way or another, come into contact with the Imam of your time. So this Sayyid of the Masjid goes, six months performing these deeds. This act of worship, six months pass, seven months come, eighth month, it comes comes back to the Arab says, hold on, you told me six months I'm going to see the Imam of my time. It's the eighth month now, I have not seen the Imam of my time. What's going on? Look at this instance, brothers and sisters. The Arab says to him, it says, first, before I tell you, tell me about an incident that happened in the Muqtasar, the place where the people are for the Wudu area. It says, how did you hear about the incident that occurred in the place of Wudu? It says, word gets around, just tell me of what occurred in this particular place where people come and, pray and uh, perform their wudu before they go into the masjid. So he says, the story, I was making wudu, all of a sudden I took my turban off, placed it, 
He says, as I sat, there was a person on the right, on the left-hand side of me. One of them was an elderly gentleman. He looks at me as I'm making wudu. He says, as I'm making wudu, he says, you know, say it with your permission, you know, I see that the ring on your little finger is a little bit tight. When you're performing wudu, maybe the water isn't entering. So if you were either to take it off or move it around in order for the water to make its way behind the ring so that the wudu is valid. So he says, me being the imam of the masjid, the person that is guiding the people around and watching, so he says, I feel it. I started getting vocal, loud. The people around me started to pay attention to what's going on. He says, you know, how can you teach me? I'm the one that's the person in charge here. Who are you to come and tell me you're an outsider? He says, you know, I apologize. I just thought I'd benefit you in one way or another. He left. He says, I've told you now what happened in the Mufti Salam. Now tell me, I've performed this act of worship for six, seven, eight months. Why have I not seen the Imam of my time? So the Araf begins to weep. He says, that person that tried to warn you about that ring was the Imam of your time. You saw him, but not how you want it. So he says, you saw him, but I wish you didn't see him in that state. Do you understand then the concept that we take from that particular story, brothers? Is the understanding that at any moment, Imam Sahib al-Asiyah could be amongst us. Because we've understood and we've elaborated on the point that the example is like that of Yusuf. We understand Yusuf was amongst his community performing all the things that he needs to. Imam Sahib al Asi was a man likewise protects the religion, safeguards the religion, is a safety net for Islam. And the final aspect of the many is that he's hand picking from every era the best of the best for his generals of the army. As we know, the first numbers play a vital role within Islam. The first battle of Islam and the final battle will have the exact number of 313. And so you'll find from every specific time from Imam Mahdi's ghaybah, he's choosing one person. And we'll understand this concept of Raja, that he will allow them to return to fight alongside him. These are the best of the best. And we pray to Allah that we are amongst his soldiers, inshallah. And tonight, where we go towards, is what we understand from this, is the role model that inspired this understanding, which is the person that defended the Imam of it. The person that we need to seek inspiration from, that everything of oppression that occurred in her life. She didn't look twice. That all the oppression, all the pain, everything that she stood for was for the protection of Islam, the protection and the safeguarding of her Imam before anything else. That's the thing that we need to take, brothers and sisters, from tonight, when we understand and try to grasp that the Imam is amongst us that we need to protect him by first and foremost perfecting ourselves. We look at Fatima al-Zahra, let's close our eyes and think to this particular notion of Fatima al-Zahra and everything that she went through at a young age. I want you to imagine the daughter of Rasulullah, that Rasulullah would treat with such gentle aspect, such soft such kindness, all of a sudden you'll find that her house is raided with fire. You'll find that she stands behind the door. You'll find that door, when it's inflamed, is pushed against Fatima to Zahra. You'll find that when this door is pushed, there's a tradition that states from the man on himself, he says, in a tradition, he says, as I pushed the door, I heard the noise of the ribs breaking behind the door. But you'll find the defender of Imam Fatima Zahra. Let's take this example. 
she comes out, what does she say to everyone that we need to learn from? The example is given when she speaks to Ot Salman, she comes out in protection of Amir al Mu'mineen. Ali ibn Abi Talib sees Fatima al Zahra come out in such a state. She, he sees that Fatima is about to pray towards Allah. He tells Salman, Salman, go and tell her her father was sent as a mercy to mankind. Let not her dua be the cause of their destruction. He comes towards Fatima, relates what Amir al Mu'mineen says to her. Fatima tells if she says to her Salman, she says, Amya Salman, Salman, they broke my rib, Salman. But I was silent. Oh Salman, they came to the house of Rasulullah with flames. They burnt the door of Rasulullah. Oh Salman, but I was silent. Oh Salman, they slapped the face of the daughter of Rasulullah. But Salman, I was silent. Salman, they made me miscarry my infant Muhsin. But Salman, I remained silent. But Salman, they take my Imam and your Mu'mineen. There is no silence for that. I will defend this religion. I will defend the Imam of my time. I take from this towards the Muhtasab. I want you to imagine a dim light in a muhtasar where they are washing Fatima to Zahra after she passes away. Asma narrates, she says, I was giving the water towards Amir al Mu'mineen. We saw Fatima to Zahra's body on the muhtasar. Very dim lighting. Amir al Mu'mineen would take from the water and would wash the body of Fatima to Zahra. As he's washed the body, Asma would narrate, Moments in, I see Amir al Mu'mineen. I try to find him in the light. I see Amir al Mu'mineen in the corner of the room. His head between his knees, crying profusely. She says, Oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, we look towards you to give us patience in such a calamity. Oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, you are the person that lifted the door of Khaybar. Oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, why do I see you in such a state? He would say, Oh, Asma, patience is beautiful. But not for Fatima to Zahra. He says, Asma, as I'm washing the body of Fatima, he says, My hands came across the broken ribs. Oh, Fatima, in that dim lighting I saw, Oh, Asma, I saw the bruised face of Fatima to Zahra. I begin to realize. That Fatima, why in her last moments she would not look at me? When I called towards her, she kept her face down, lest I see the bruises on her face. Oh, Asma, this was all to protect Ali ibn Abi Talib. He sees Hazar and Hussein on the outskirts of the room. He says, Hazar and Hussein, Zainab and Kulthum, come towards Fatima to Zahra. This is the last moments in which Hassan and Hussein see Fatima. The last moments which Zainab and Um Kulthum see Fatima to Zahra. The tradition says that they all throw themselves on the body of their mother Fatima to Zahra. Of them saying, Ummah, I am your beloved Al Hassan. The other from the left hand side saying, Ummah, I am your beloved Al Hussein. Will you not respond towards me? And they began to embrace her until the tradition says, Amir al Mu'mineen says, Wal Aisha Ladi Aashahu Rasulullah, Samiatu Zahra, Anna Tua Hannat, Wa Akhrajat Yadaha, Wa Havanat al Hassan wa al Hussein. He says, By Rasulullah and his life, I heard the voice of Fatima moaning in agony, taking her hands from the shroud and embracing Hassan and embracing Hussein, in which Jibrail comes towards Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and says, Oh Ali, take Hassan and Hussein off the chest of Fatima because it's making the angels of the sky weep. Oh Amir al Mu'mineen, I end on this note. Oh, Amir al Mu'mineen, if the angels could not handle Hassan and Hussein on the chest of Fatima, how could they handle Shimur sitting on the chest of Abba Abdullah? 
إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون وسيعلم الذين ظلموا آل محمد أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين. Brothers, raise your hands in dua, inshallah. As you pray towards Allah with these tears on these holy nights, that He allows us to be in such a state in every moments of our lives that we become of those that the Imam would be proud to be calling us of his followers. We pray to Allah that if we die that Allah resurrects us amongst the companions and of the soldiers of Imam Sahib al Asr al Zaman. We pray towards Allah that he keeps us steadfast on this path. We ask Allah for Husn al Aqibah. We pray to Allah for the Surah al Mubarakat al Fatiha that before it allowed Salawat al Muhammad wa ali Muhammad